There will be youth band practice for the musicians only at 6 o'clock. So if you're a musician, please be here at 6 o'clock. There will also be youth service at 7 p.m. That is a J.D. Anna senior night, um, and she will be speaking, so you don't want to miss that. Come out and support. Also, this Saturday, April 6th, the Singles Ministry will be meeting at 11 a.m. in the bi no, in the Fellowship Hall. That's where they'll be meeting at 11 a.m. If you have any questions, talk to Sister Valda. Also, please check your emails, and don't forget to RSVP uh, for the Alvarado Wedding Shower uh, by this Saturday, April 6th. The shower will be next weekend on the 13th at 1 p.m. So if you have any questions, please talk to the ladies team. Also, Brother Collins sent out an email with details for Louisiana Men's Conference. Um, if you did not receive that email, please get in contact with him so he can get your updated information. And as always, don't forget the cleaning schedule. Are you ready to praise the Lord? Amen. Let's have church. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. We worship you, Lord God. We thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus, for the opportunity you've given us to worship you and praise you, Lord God. Thank you, Jesus.
give you praise. God has done so much for us. All, all we can do is praise Him and thank Him for what He's done in our lives. Hallelujah. Yes, God, I rejoice. In the good times, I rejoice. In the not so good times, Lord, I rejoice in you, God. Oh, let's give Him a hand clap of praise. Hallelujah. Jesus, hallelujah, we praise you, God. We thank you, Jesus, and I will bless your holy name, God. I will bless your holy name, Jesus, because you are good. You are good all the time, God. All the blessings I have is because of you, Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Yes. Come on, church. God has been so good to us. Yes. Yes. I bless you, Lord. We magnify your holy name.
Lord, when I begin to think where the Lord has taken me out from, I said, when I begin to think, look back, and think of where my life would have been, oh, I can't just be standing there, I just want to praise him, I just want to dance to the Lord, and say, God, you have been so good to me. You have blessed me, Lord. You have blessed my family. You have blessed, Lord God, my children. Yes, God. Woo. Hallelujah. I know what you came for, but I came to praise the Lord. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. We praise you, God. Hallelujah. Why not right there where you're at? Why don't you lift your hands and praise him? We thank you, Lord God. You have been so good, Jesus. Tú has sido bueno, Jesús. Tu misericordia me ha seguido todos los días de mi vida. Your mercy has, has followed me every day of my life, God. And I will praise you, Lord. And I thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah, Lord God. house tonight, why don't you go ahead and give him some praise. He is worthy, he is worthy. For we love you, Jesus. Oh, we praise you, Lord. You led me out of the desert. Brought me into his streets. River of living water. Took my bitter into sweet. All my Shackles off my feet Cause there's no sound Louder than A captive set free So let the redeemed Of the Lord Say so Sing of his Promises Evermore Pour out your thankfulness Let it
can never thank you enough, oh Lord, for all that you've done for me, God. Something inside of me just has to cry out, God. I bless you, Jesus. I praise you, God. Come on, somebody pour your praise on him. He is worthy. Hallelujah. We lift you up, Jesus. Because there's no sound louder than a captive set free. Because there's no sound louder than a captive set free. Because there's no sound louder than a captive set free. And there's no sound louder than a captive set free. There's no sound louder than a captive set free. There's no sound louder than a captive set free. There's no sound louder than a captive set free. Come on all over the house with the sound of the redeemed rise in this place. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, we praise you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord God. We praise your holy name, Jesus. Thank you, Lord God. Jesus.
God has given us the victory, amen. God has given us the victory over everything, over everything that wants to come against our lives. Oh, hallelujah. Yes, hallelujah. I don't know what Monday, Tuesday, or Wednesday has brought you, but I want to tell you that God is with you. That God has made you more than conqueror. God has made you more than victorious. Hallelujah. To the blood of the Lamb. Hallelujah. For the word of our testimony. Thank you, Jesus. Why don't you give him a hand clap of praise? Hallelujah. Yes. Thank you, Jesus. You have made us victorious, God. More than conquerors, God. More than conquerors, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Sometimes the enemy might wants you to feel small. He wants you to feel defeated. He wants you to forget uh, what name you went in the waters. What name you've been baptized. What blood has washed away your sins. But you need to stand up to that devil and say, I have been washed all by the blood of the Lamb. Yes, by the blood of Jesus. Hallelujah. The devil ain't got no power. I said the devil ain't got no power. Hallelujah. God has other power. He has given us as well that power to become and be victorious in the name of Jesus. All right, I'm going to leave this mic somewhere because I'm going to start preaching, sister. <laughs> Let's move on to the next thing. <laughs> Praise God. God is good. Amen. Thank you, Lord. We want to go ahead and go, um, go to, um, what's next, the ministry team? <laughs> It's been a hot minute since I've been since I haven't been up here, brother. <laughs> All right, we want to go ahead and call the ministry team up to pray. If you have a need, if you have a, a, a certain circumstance that you believe and you know that God can do it, you can come right up. Amen. We want to go to God in prayer for um, um, Brother Riggs. He's out of the ICU, so we want to thank God for that. But we want to continue praying for him. We want to go to God in prayer for uh, Brother Seth. He's recovering from surgery. Um, James Doyle, who is in the hospital and in critical condition. Also for my father-in-law, Brother Gil. He's also in ICU with infections. And also for his sister Tanya, who's, who's you know, taking days off of her work and stuff now to be able to be with him. And so also for strength for her in the name of Jesus. Sister Jackie and Brother Juan, who uh, their father passed away last week. Let's pray for peace and comfort in the name of Jesus. For K Casey Haby, who is he uh, needs healing of cancer. Sister Vickers, Sister Jeannie, who just found out that she has stage 4 cancer. So let's pray for them in the name of Jesus. She needs a miracle in the name of Jesus. Also for Roger Bentley, who needs healing. So if you need a, if you need God to minister into your life, why don't you come up to the front? You have a need. Any one of these ministers are able and ready to pray for you in the name of Jesus. Lord God, we give you the glory, Jesus. We give you the honor, Lord God. We thank you, Jesus, for what you've already done, God. Oh, for the names up here in the screens, Lord, you know that we still haven't forgotten about them, Lord. For these names and these in these prayer jar, God, we believe and we know that you are able, God, that you can hear us and you can hear our prayers, Lord. And we believe that you are able, God. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Why don't you stretch out your hand to the ones who need prayer up in the front, church? Yes, Lord. We thank you, Jesus. We thank you, Lord God.
for what you've already done, God. We thank you, Lord. We praise you, God, for what you're already doing, Lord, in my life, in my need, in my circumstances, God. I give them to you, not trusting you, believing that you are able, God. Why don't we give him a hand clap of praise? Oh, believing like how he, he has already done it, that he has already answered our prayers in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord God. If you have any tithes, offering, and missions, you can go ahead and get, bring those up to the front. We also want to welcome any first-time guests who, has, who have joined us this evening. Uh, we want to welcome you. This is a guest pack. If you haven't already gotten one, one of the ushers can get you one of those. We just want to thank you uh, for worshiping with us tonight and, um, and for coming to church today. Also, this, there's the, um, the screens. You can re reference them if you haven't already um, heard the announcements. But we have awesome things going on in our church. Amen. Why don't you give uh, your neighbor $100? Maybe 500. Why don't you greet your brother and sister in the name of Jesus?
Amen. Look at the person next to you. Say, I'm really glad you're here with me. If you're joining us online, we're glad you're with us. If you're a guest tonight, we're glad you're with us. Thank you for coming to the Jesus Church. Amen. To all that, to all that work together to make Easter special, thank you for that. To all that are actually listening to me, thank you for that. The four of you, I appreciate it. Brother Tim, Brother Cody, about three of us. Amen. Man, you probably noticed Sister Tanya's not here. Brother Gill is in ICU, although he is doing a little bit better. But um, let's take a moment and pray for him, just especially they're that way. In Jesus' name, touch Brother Gill, God. Strengthen him. Get him out of the hospital right now. Rebuke that infection, oh God, and the cause of it. I'm asking, oh God, you to turn this situation around, oh God. Let Stratani get rest. Give her strength, oh Lord. In Jesus' name. Somebody say amen. Amen. And Brother Seth, I know you're watching. We're praying for you. And um, amen. Believing recovery from the surgery and back to life as normal. Amen. It's good to see Jackie Woods. We're praying for your family in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Last, last night we had Bible study here, and we also had Bible study in Sabinal. And the Sabinal Bible study had nine new people in it. So to God be the glory for that. Amen. Thank you, Jesus, for that. And that's definitely a praise report. Keep these, keep these things in your, in your in our prayers. We, we need to cover them in a prayer. We need God to be in this. Amen. And uh, if God's for us, it's going to be a beautiful thing. Amen. And so remember this. A couple things coming up. Just want to remind you a couple of things, a couple of weird things, a couple of different things. Mother's Day this year, we will have uh, a Mother's Day service that morning, but IBC Praise or Corral, Corral will be with us. So IBC Corral will be singing that morning, so they'll be doing all the music, so it'll be really cool, and I think Will's going to be with them. And uh, I actually talked to him and Jeff and Peter this week. It's the, it's the week. It's the week for wayward Hitchcock children to call in, I guess. And uh, they seem to be doing pretty good. But I'll uh, be thinking about that. We still will honor mothers, of course, but it's going to be a special day. And if I remember right, that Mother's Day evening service is our annual business meeting. Be thinking about that as well. Also, Memorial Day weekend, pastor will preach that Sunday morning. Sunday night, uh, Bishop Bernard will be with us, Brother Bernard. Uh, and so he is my general superintendent and a uh, pretty smart guy and a mentor in our life. He's going to be in the area. And he's going to preach for us that Sunday night. He said, do you want me to preach on Memorial Day weekend? I was like, it doesn't matter. We'll have church. So if you're making plans, that's fine. But if you want to be here, that'll be a special treat. He hasn't been here since our, uh, our uh, dedication, so it's been a little bit. So be praying for these things, and I believe God is going to be in them. Also, at the end of May, I just want to prepare you now ahead of time. Uh, MV ISD, Medina Valley Independent School District, has changed their graduation to a Wednesday night this year. It's a long story. I have nothing to do with it. I absolutely, Mr. Superintendent, if you're listening, think it's absolutely dumb. But anyway, um, just this year, it'll probably change back. They're putting new turf in the stadium, and so it's unavailable for graduation. I'm not sure why they did that, the timing to uh, mess with graduation. So uh, we have a couple of graduates. Kat's graduating, JD's graduating. And so I have no choice but really to cancel church that Wednesday night. But the good news is, is at Freeman Coliseum, and if you want to come, you're welcome. It's, we got all the seats you want. We, we can have 100,000 people come join us. Amen. So uh, that's the last Wednesday in May. So a little weird this year. I pray in Jesus' name it's the only year I'm not canceling church just because it's my daughter graduating. They've never done it on a Wednesday night. So what do you do, right? What do you do? So I, I miss what... I miss what he said. I have church Tuesday night. I, I appreciate that, but I've got a ton of family coming in. It would be a huge burden on me. That's okay. So anyway, so remember these things. Also, we are a couple weeks away from uh, a kind of a transition in our Bible studies, and uh, we have two more lessons in God's Master Plan on Tuesday night, and then we're going we're gonna to shift and for five weeks do the translation series. And so if you've ever been interested in, for example, why our church is a multi-translation church and where I'm coming from to that, um, why 
um, it's actually on purpose that I don't preach from the KJV and actually recommend our preachers not to preach from that. If you'd like answers for those things, we'll be covering those in five lessons. If you went through, um, <clears throat> if you went through the translation series before, this one's pretty radically different. Um, it's, it's completely redone, and um, so it's, it's, there, there are a few elements that are probably the same, but even the order of the lessons and what they're covering are totally redone. And there's a reason for that. We've we had a plethora of English translations and a lot of revisions. And uh, some of them, for example, the NIV was updated in 2011 and basically fixed everything I had to complain against. So I can't have a lesson complaining about the NIV. The new NIV is great. So anyway, but if you want to be a part of that, if you've ever seen like on social media these posts that, you know, the KJV has these verses and the ESV doesn't have these verses and you actually want to know why, um, it's for you. If it doesn't interest you and you don't care, don't come. But if you are coming, I need to know you're coming, so I have enough copies for you. So there's a sign-up sheet out in the front, and we're calling it, catch this, the Revised English Translation Series. <laughs> and if I redo it in 10 years, I'm going to call it the New Revised English Translation <laughs> Series. And then if I do it again, these are preacher jokes. If I do it again in another 10 years, I'm going to call it the New Revised English Translation Update. I pray I live that long. See kind of what I'm doing there. It's just having a little fun with it. it it's it's lighthearted, but a serious study. If you'd like to be a part, come join us. Somebody say amen. amen. We're in the book of Judges tonight. Judges chapter 10 and Judges chapter 12. No, I'm not skipping chapter 11. That's next week. Judges chapter 10, verse 1. Judges chapter 12, verse 8. How many of you learned something in the Judges series? And uh, it's been a little hard hitting, but tonight it's going to be K Love. It's going to be wonderful, fabulous. So we're in Judges chapter 10, verse 1, and then also Judges chapter 12, verse 8. Here we go. Judges chapter 10, verse 1 says, after Abimelech, say, I'm glad to get rid of him. Ooh, that was last week. What a horrible judge. After Abimelech, there arose to save Israel. Notice the, the positive phrase. Everybody save, to say to save Israel. Tola. The son of Pua, son of Dodo. Sometimes the jokes just write themselves, folks. I've never met a man like Joshua, son of a nun, but I have met a lot of sons of Dodo. Can I get a witness? Let's try again. After Abimelech, there arose to save Israel. Say it, save Israel. Tola, that's his name. The son of Pua, son of Dodo, a man of Issachar. And he lived at Shamir in the hill country of Ephraim. And he judged Israel 23 years. Then he died and was buried at Shamir. That makes sense because that's where he lived. Verse 3. After him arose Jair. Everybody say Jair. Jair. Jair the Gileadite who judged Israel 22 years. Everybody say 22 years. 22 years. And he had... 30 sons who rode on 30 donkeys. Now, that's very convenient because if you have 30 sons, you only have 29 donkeys. <laughs> Y'all might as well get ready for this lesson. He had 30 sons who rode on 30 donkeys, and they had 30 cities called Havoth Jair to this day, which are in the land of Gilead, which is, again, convenient because that's where he was from. And Jair died and was buried in Kimon. Now, why he was not buried in Gilead, I don't know. Maybe there was too many donkeys. Come on, you got to get excited about this. I, I, I'm getting it. I'm trying to ignore it. I only laugh at the joke when I make it. Now, let's skip over. We're going to skip chapter 11. Y'all rough crowd already tonight. In a different sort of way, kind of rough crowd. And we're going to skip over to Judges chapter 12, verse 8. Judges 12 and 8. After him, Ibzon of Bethlehem. Look at somebody and say, I've never heard of these people in my life. <laughs> After him, Ibzon. Everybody say Ibzon. Of Bethlehem judged Israel. He had, here we go, 30 sons and 30 daughters he gave in marriage outside his clan, which is always best. You don't want to go to family reunions looking for marriage. 
And 30 daughters he brought in from outside for his sons, and he judged Israel seven years. Somebody right about now is wondering why they made the effort to come to church. <laughs> then Ibzon died and was buried at Bethlehem, verse 11. After him, Elon, everybody say Elon. Elon. The Zebulonite judged Israel, and he judged Israel 10 years. Then Elon the Zebulonite died and was buried at Hyagelon in the land of Zebulun. After him, Abdon, everybody say Abdon. The son of Hillel, the Pirathonite, judged Israel. He had 40 sons and 30 grandsons. That'd be 70 together. Who rode on, here we go, 70 donkeys. And he judged Israel eight years. Then, wait for it, Abdon, the son of Hillel, the Pirathonite, died and was buried at Pirathon in the land of Ephraim in the hill country of the Amalekites. Well, that was exciting. So tonight, we're talking about five different judges. Tola, Jair, Ibzon, Elon, and Abnon. And our subject is unsung heroes. Unsung heroes. How many of you know it doesn't matter if people know your name? It matters if God knows your name. That's the most important thing. Father, we ask God you to help us and talk to us tonight. God, even God, from an obscure corner of, of your scripture and your word, speak to us. I'm asking God for your graciousness and your goodness to be with us. Touch us, O oh God. Anoint us. Prepare our hearts to receive your word and let us live it out in Jesus' name. And we receive whatever you would say to us. We open our lives to you, God. We want to be pleasing to you in every way. In Jesus' name. Somebody clap your hands one more time. Come on, he's worthy. <laughs> Hallelujah. Come on, he's worthy. We glorify you. We praise you. We honor you, Jesus. Nobody like you, God. Amen, amen, amen. You may be seated tonight. Amen. After Abimelech, who was the Bramble King, everybody say the Bramble King, after he was defeated, horrible judge, we read of a man named Tola, and then after him, Jair, who ruled Israel, and then we're introduced in chapter 11 to Jephthah. Everybody say Jephthah. Jephthah is the lesson, next week's lesson. He's one of the big four of the book of Judges, and the book gives two full chapters to Jephthah's exploits and adventures. And, and, and after Jephthah, we read of three more obscure judges named Ibzon, Elon, and Abdon. And after that comes the most famous, or should I say infamous judge of all the book, Samson. So we're going to deal with Abimelech and Samson just as we have done with Deborah and Gideon, the, the big four that the judges, uh, the book of Judges really gives time to. We're going to deal with those in a future lesson. But tonight I'm going to put these five lesser known men, and though they're split up in two groups by time sequence, uh, I've put them together in one lesson because they have great similarities to each other. Again, five probably names that most of you have never heard before. Tola and Jair, and then Ibzon, Elon, and Abdon. Virtually everything we know about them has to be discerned from the, I don't know, 5, 10, 15 verses of Scripture that we have read tonight. But I've learned something about the Word of God, that even when the Scripture records seemingly dumb details, even obscure things, even random things, if the Word of God gives space to it, then there is something, there's a rhyme and a reason to it. Can I get a witness? And so when we pause just for a moment, maybe the only time in your life we'll ever do it, and we begin to think about what Scripture deems important about these five unknown men's lives, even from the smallest detail, suddenly what seemed insignificant becomes much more impressive. I just want to read it to you again. Abimelech's whole life is capsulated in two verses, Judges 10 and 1. After Abimelech, there arose to save Israel Tola, the son of Pua, son of Dodo, a man of Issachar, and he lived at Shemir in the hill country of Ephraim, and he judged Israel 23 years, 23 years, and he died and was buried at Shemir. For 23 years of great service, it seems a little unfair that he only gets two verses in the word of the Lord. And then verse 3, after him arose Jair the Gileadite who judged Israel. Think about it, 22 years, 22 years of doing right. And uh, he had 30 sons who rode on 30 donkeys and they had 30 cities. And, and, and then verse 5, Jair dies and is buried. And again, this faithful man, he gets basically three verses. And, 
And when we look at that at first in casual glance, can I preach to you? We're not going to take long to get there. But at casual glance, just reading, it seems like it's unforgettable. It seems unimportant until you begin to think about that this is being recorded against the backdrop of these other men that we have studied. You with me here today? That, that when you look at this and you think about of all the things that God wanted us to know about, let's say, Tola or Jair's life, that really what it's remarkable for is what is not recorded in those verses. That, that his life is more impressive for what is not there. That Abimelech, the guy who before him, the bramble king, uh, he had been a usurper. He had been a godless man. He had been an idolater, full of himself, a murderer. But after the death of somebody who is such a poor role model as his predecessor, a man named Tola, who never knew anybody to rule Israel in a righteous way, yet rises up without any kind of role model to inspire him. Uh, and he judges Israel, Tola does, uh, he judges Israel faithfully for 23 years uh, so that when the scripture wants to record what it wants to know about Tola it says he saved Israel uh, and he was faithful for 23 years uh, and then Jair uh, we get a little bit more information but he follows uh, and basically does the same for 22 years what I'm preaching to you tonight is this uh, there were no great conquests uh, in the time of, 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 of Tola and Jair uh, because uh, there was no enemy invaded uh, because because while they served the Lord and ruled, Israel served the Lord. Under their leadership, the promised land was supposed to be, it was exactly what God had intended. There's no stories of Tola and Jair like there was with Gideon having to sneak through the night to tear down idols secretly or to stand up against their father's idols because the people of Israel largely didn't worship idols during this time. They worshiped the one true living God. God. Uh, there's no supernatural deliverances uh, to record in the life of these two men because, uh, amen, there was no supernatural deliverance needed uh, because for 45 years, a little over an entire generation, uh, the people of Israel uh, followed these men's leadership uh, and served the Lord exactly as they were supposed to. There's no scandals. Uh, there's no sibling rivalries. Uh, there's no murders. Uh, can I get a witness? Uh, there's no sensational webs of lies that have to be unraveled uh, or lives that are torn apart. Uh, and they're remarkable mainly for what's not present in their life. Uh, and when you consider that this is the book of Judges, uh, when you consider that what was going on before them uh, and frankly after them, uh, amen, these two men named Tola and Jair, uh, amen, who may be unknown in modern times, uh, but when you realize what they did, you should be impressed uh, because each of these men single-handedly uh, paused uh, the cycle of sin uh, in their families, uh, in their neighbors' families, uh, in their neighboring towns, uh, and ultimately in their nation. Uh, they saved Israel, uh, and they lived for God faithfully uh, in the darkest times spiritually uh, of God's people. Uh, and I want to tell you, uh, I don't know if they've ever gotten an applause, uh, but you ought to clap your hands uh, for two men. Uh, who were good role models. I'm going to kind of treat to you tonight from these men's lives. Can I do that tonight? I want to pull some principles from their life. And one is the greater testimony is always that of consistent faithfulness. That I know these men's stories. We just read the five verses of Tola and Jair. I know it's not as flashy as Gideon's victory. I know it's not well known as Samson's exploits, but they're really much greater in the end. Amen. Tola and Jair are what we would call unsung heroes, uh, unsung heroes, uh, people who are faithful and people who do extraordinary things uh, despite no obvious dramatic spiritual intervention. That they never have to call fire down from heaven. Uh, they never have to call on God to send a storm to get them out of their mess uh, because they never made decisions in the first place uh, that got their people uh, in a mess. Uh, they didn't create the mess in the first place, uh, thus they don't have to cry, save us. Uh, 
Can I get a witness? Uh, these are the people who never get the headlines. Uh, they never get the attention in this world. Uh, but I want to tell you that one day in heaven, uh, these are the people who will get the seats of honor. Uh, people who simply obey the Lord. Uh, people who just live their life following his path. Uh, people who choose to live blessed lives uh, and never need to topple idols uh, because they never make an idol. Uh, they never carve an idol. Uh, and they never set up an idol in their home. Uh, they just give their life in faithful worship. Uh, I want to tell somebody, uh, whether anybody else knows your name, uh, if you'll be faithful, uh, I will guarantee you uh, that the God of glory knows your name. Can I treat you a little bit? Can I? In our times, there is a tendency, I don't want to be misunderstood tonight, but in our times, there is a tendency to glorify people's testimonies when God plucks people from deep, deep pits of sin and from dark holes of unrighteous mire. And so lest I be misunderstood tonight, I just want to say with my hand on the Bible, I'm glad that we serve a God of a second chance. I'm glad we serve a God of the third and fourth chance. I'm glad we serve the God of the 30th and the 44th chance. I'm glad we serve the God of the 10,673rd and a half chance. Because I think that's kind of where I am. Can I get a witness? I thank God that when I fall, he's there to help me. I thank God we can be restored. I thank God for any backslider that comes home and is forgiven. So my disclaimer made, I want to say, sometimes though, there is in the kingdom of God, especially Pentecost, there is an over-glorification of these things in our human minds that sometimes gets people to thinking that in order to be truly great in the kingdom of God, they, they've got to go out there and experience sin to the fullest, uh, get their lives in a big mess, uh, make all sort of fleshly mistakes, and then have some great story or testimony of deliverance. And I just want to go on record as saying, you don't have to do that to be great in the kingdom of God. God can deliver the worst sinner. He can forgive the lowest human being. Come on, did he not save the apostle Paul who claimed I'm the chief of all sinners and who literally murdered people for believing? But greater than the great deliverance of overcoming baggage is somebody who just chooses to live for God all their life, who chooses to obey godly principles and is not so dense that they have to learn everything the hard way and that never have to be delivered from baggage because they just said, I'm not going to pick it up. I, I think I'll do things God's way. Uh, that's just as great or greater a testimony, uh, the testimony of faithfulness. Uh, if God has delivered you from much and a past that's to be ashamed of, uh, give him glory for it. Uh, amen. But if God has kept you from a past, uh, give him glory for it. Uh, and if you've got a past, uh, don't over glorify it to the point uh, that it sounds desirable. <laughs> to God... Consistent faithfulness is the greatest testimony. I just want to go on record tonight saying that Tola and Jair, these first two judges, are more mighty in God's eyes than Samson ever was. Because they were able to do something that the strong man could not do, uh, which was live for God faithfully. Your, your strength, man, is not judged on how many gates you can pick up or how many women you can vanquish or how many ropes you can burn or how many pectoral muscles show when you flex in your shirt and it pulls away like the big hulk. Uh, your manliness uh, is really defined by whether or not you have backbone enough uh, to do what's right and live for God no matter what anybody else is doing. Whether you're comfortable praying and whether you're comfortable worshiping God. Oh, that men would lift up holy hands uh, without wrath and doubting. <laughs> Samson, despite all of his great stories and strength, uh, he failed to really impact his generation to live for God. And he failed to fully deliver them from their bondage. When you get to the time of David, which is after the time of King Saul, which is after the time of Judges, uh, you find that David is having to fight a Philistine giant. Uh, and every step of the way for half of his life, uh, he's having to deal with Philistines. Why? Uh, because Samson uh, didn't deliver them from the Philistines. Uh, though he was mighty, uh, he yet was a weak man. Uh, but Tola, who had no supernatural strength, uh, Tola, who sometimes struggled to get out of bed, uh, yet he was faithful living for God. Uh, 
That's the mighty man because he could do what the mighty man could not. Hallelujah. Amen. You may not, you may not get much attention because typically in a church, the squeaky wheel gets the grease. And human nature is to give the more, more dramatic the most attention. But if you're here and you have not learned everything the hard way, and you're just being faithful to God, know you've got a greater testimony than the lowest sinner that God picked up out of the pit. Come on, let's not be the big brother. Let's rejoice with every backslider that walks in. Uh, every backslider that prays through, let's rejoice. Uh, but let's also rejoice in the, in the teenager that raises up in a Pentecostal church uh, and never backslides and marries in the church and lives for God and, uh, and has a ministry and is fulfilled. Let's rejoice in that too. The world crowns success, but God crowns faithfulness. Be an unsung hero. Don't do it for man's applause. Be an unsung hero. Because if men never applaud you, God will. Because God one day will reward the most people like Tola and Jair. And so Tola and Jair are awesome accounts because of the context of their godly influences. They don't have any supernatural strength. They don't have, there's no fleecing of God. <laughs> no fancy pleas, no sneaking into the enemy's camp to hear of a barley cake in a dream. No elaborate vows, we'll get there next week. No, no desperate endeavors, just, just men doing what's right, leading others by holy example and bridging the gap in their generation, handing off the torch of truth. Uh, the other set of judges, Ibzan, Elon, and Abdon, they serve for a lesser time, only 25 years total, but they have much the same legacy. It's not, it's not written on any of these men's lives uh, that Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. That phrase only comes uh, after their lives were over because on their watch, uh, it, not, not on my watch, devil, it didn't happen on their watch. And, and so these five men are unsung Heroes of righteousness, the, you'll probably never go to one day see a play that's advertised and have it Tola and Jair or Ibzon, Elon, and Abdon. I keep having to look at my notes to remember their names. Uh, you're, you're, you're never, you're never, <laughs> you're never going to, when I was putting this together, I kept writing, I kept writing uh, 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 Jola and Tayer and realized I was flipping the two things. It's Tola and Jair. It, it, they're, just, they're just not, they don't stick in your head. They're not that kind of name. You're never going to go see a play or see a movie advertise the, the five unsung heroes of judges because they just live for God. But one day, their actions will be a blockbuster in heaven. I want us to consider these traits of these men so we can emulate them. And we scan these few verses. Don't laugh, don't laugh. When we scan these few verses of our text, we realize that there is something they have a similarity to each other. That, that the two reoccurring traits common to these men's identities, the first trait is of great childbearing. Jair had 30 sons. That's a lot of, that's a lot of sons. Ibsen had 30 sons and 30 daughters. That's a lot of kids. Abdon had 40 sons and 30 grandsons. Hello, somebody. Brother Ed, you'd be broke. Can I get a witness? And, and then, so the first trait is of, of, of great childbearing. Then the second trait, there's only two, is that of, and this sounds stupid, but it's of riding donkeys. Jair's 30 sons rode, rode upon 30 donkeys. Abdon's sons and grandsons rode upon 70 donkeys. And so the, the, <laughs> these, two, these two themes of what the Bible wanted us to know, the details about these unsung heroes of faithfulness, is that, that of childbearing and donkeys. And I want you to realize, first of all, that those two things in this time period spoke to the blessings of God. You with me here today? Amen. In those days, to have a son was esteemed as the greatest thing ever because, because you, you might become the Messiah or the father of the Messiah. The Messiah had not come yet. And to ride a donkey, man, you didn't have to walk. Can I get a witness? And it was a sign of blessing. Amen. But I think both of those things also speak to us as keys to why these men could be blessed and why they could be faithful. If the Bible wants to emphasize these two details recorded, we should take those things as clues uh, that will help us to be as these men were. So the two points tonight, or there's actually three, but just pretend there's two. One is childbearing is a secret to success in serving the Lord. Now, let me just say this. By childbearing, lest the women get nervous, I'm speaking of spiritual metaphors. I'm not wishing any woman here 
to have 30 sons and 30 daughters. And I would imagine for that to happen, there has to be more than one mama involved. I'm just going to guess 60, 60 kids is a little overboard for one woman. So I'm not wishing that we go back to polygamy. We have to understand in the time and the day it was. But you need to understand that in the Old Testament, these things are types and shadows of spiritual things that we can learn. That the Bible talks about that when a person enters the kingdom of God, the only way they can enter the kingdom of God, Jesus said, is to be born again or to be born of the water and of the spirit. Can I get a witness? And so living for God my entire life and having been very familiar with the affairs of the work of the kingdom of God. Unfortunately, and I'm not going to name names, but unfortunately I have seen some good friends and I have seen some fellow worshipers and I have seen even uh, fellow ministers and pastors get hung up on something, get offended, get discouraged, or even give up their faith and give up not just preaching but giving up on living for God altogether. And in every case, though the reasons they would give you as an excuse are varied, uh, in every case I have noticed there is this common trait that's present in every backsliding and falling away and that is that new people coming to God, people being introduced to truth ceases somewhere to be a priority in their life and in their church. They either stop winning people to God, stop trying to win new people to God or stop caring about a harvest. And I just want to go on record a church that doesn't care about a harvest and a person that doesn't care about new people who have never heard the gospel, hearing the gospel, uh, amen, uh, are already spiritually dying uh, because you cannot be blessed uh, without caring about spiritual childbearing uh, in the kingdom of God. You might as well get with me. Those who are faithful in the long term, those whose faithfulness is measured by decades and lifespans uh, are those who make it a point uh, to bear children into the kingdom of God spiritually. Uh, again, these natural examples in the Old Testament, uh, they always speak to spiritual realities in the New Testament. Uh, you see, if I'm, if I'm wanting to impress somebody new, uh, if I'm wanting to introduce somebody to Jesus, uh, it, it's almost impossible to take a night off from church. Uh, it's impossible to slack off. Uh, it's impossible to ease off. It's impossible to be unfaithful. Looking around tonight, there are people that are members of our church, and I'm sure they'll be back Sunday morning, and they're not here tonight, and it's because it's not a priority, and it's because they're making dumb decisions, and it's because they're spiritually cold, but I can guarantee you one thing trading all of them. They haven't invited anybody to this service. Don't sit down on me. Because if they had invited somebody to this service, uh, they'd have been here. Uh, they'd have been ready. Uh, they'd have been expecting. Uh, somewhere they've lost uh, their place in the kingdom of God. Uh, their point uh, is to win somebody else. Uh, my point is to reproduce myself uh, in the kingdom of God. Uh, if I ever lose sight of that, uh, I lose sight. Ah, uh, Come on, somebody. Uh, hey, was Easter service a success or not? Uh, can I tell you uh, that there were over 50 people uh, that heard the gospel of Jesus Christ preached uh, in Acts 2.38 uh, and two that were baptized in Jesus' name, uh, I think it's a success. Uh, it's not about the numbers. Uh, it's about new people encountering Jesus. They might have come for the, for the fajitas. I have, people, I have people make comments. They're just here for the food. Yeah, but they heard the gospel. Amen. When, when, I, when I'm trying to win somebody, it's impossible to ease up and just kind of be nonchalant about the things of God. And if I'm constantly selling the good points of God to others accurately, then I'm constantly reinforcing a positive mentality in, in my own mind toward God. Every marriage goes through it. You married them because there was something that attracted you to them. Just because you're old and bitter and forgot it doesn't mean it ain't there. And, and the problem is, is people get married and then they start focusing on the negative traits of the other person. Time out. That's not how you got together. If you'd have done that from the beginning, you wouldn't have married each other. But, and somewhere you have to make up in your mind uh, rather than harping on all the negatives, uh, which were always there, honey. Uh, amen. Focus on the things that attracted her too. Uh, oh, I like her little split in her hair. Uh, oh, I like her dark glasses. Uh, oh, I like her cute little smile. Uh, oh, I like the fact she's kicking me to see me move on. Uh, And you can do that with God, too. 
When you're on fire for God, the church is great. The pastor is awesome. The pastor's wife is beautiful. The people are great. It's an awesome thing. But when you start focusing on negative and trying to nitpick, uh, all of a sudden, uh, God begins to diminish. Uh, but my Bible says, oh, magnify the Lord with me. Uh, let us exalt uh, his name uh, together. <laughs> Watch this. By focusing on teaching other people the basics, I'm more thoroughly grounding myself in those same scriptural truths. Maybe a personal analogy might prove helpful in illustrating this. Forgive the personal reference, but I got the mic, so just give it time. I attended Bible college. I was raised in an apostolic home, many years in a pastor's home. But the ability to quote hundreds of scripture references on given subjects was not in me. Just because I was the pastor's kid, or just because I went to Sunday school, or just because my parents made me go to youth, or just because I graduated from Bible college, that ability to quote scripture and teach Bible studies and give answers, it was only put into me when I began to make an effort to teach other people the basics. I used for a long time, I used to have a little cheat sheet. It was a little piece of paper. It was cut down. It was folded. It was right behind my driver's license in my license, uh, right in my wallet rather. And it was the scriptures of, 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 of a salvation made simple. Not the commentary, just the scriptures. Uh, all the scriptures on one side were on the oneness of God. Uh, on the other was Jesus' name baptism. Uh, and I kept it there because uh, there had been a time where I had met somebody and I needed those scriptures. Uh, and I sounded like Daffy Duck uh, with amnesia. Just, blah, blah, blah. I couldn't think of a scripture to save my life, and I was embarrassed. And I said, I'm never going to do that again. So I had a little cheat sheet, and uh, it's laughable now. Some of you don't even believe it, but there came a day when, uh, amen, I was talking to somebody, uh, and I no longer reached for the cheat sheet because I had done it over and over and over again till now it just flows out and now I'm 47 years old hadn't looked at that sheet in 20 years uh, can I tell you it's because when I began to reach somebody else uh, and to have childbirth uh, somebody else to be born again uh, that's what reinforced me in the kingdom of God my college degree is in music forgive the personal analogy in college they spend a whole year teaching you the basic scales there's 12 major scales, 15 if you count fully. There, 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 are, there are 12 major scales, each with seven modes. There are, there are four different types of minor scales. They're natural minor scales, they're harmonic minor, they're, they're uh, melodic minor, and jazz melodic minor. And then there are, and there's 12 of them, 12 of each of those. And then there are pentatonic scales, five note scales, blues scales, which are six note scales, chromatic scales, which are 12 note scales, whole note scales, Diminished scales, and I'm not even talking about jazz hybrid scales from the bebop area. And when I graduated college, in order to graduate, I had to have in my head the formula of how to make all those scales. I had to be able to sit down at a piano and somebody would say, for example, let's do C uh, uh, harmonic minor scale. And I had to be able to sit there and, and, and do that. You with me there? Okay? I had to know them in a head type of way. But the problem was when I would go to play, my brain would freeze. And I would just think, there are black notes and white notes. And I'm sweating out the end of my fingertips. And God helped me to hit the right ones. But I started doing something when I got out of college. I started teaching, I started teaching Bibles, I mean piano lessons. That was not a mistake. I'm having a little fun. I started teaching piano lessons. And in the piano lessons, you know what you do? People are starting at the beginning. And so day in and day out, sometimes some 25 or 30 hours a week of my line, I taught them major scales. And I taught them why it was important. And I would play them over and over and over again. And finally, I'd get some that were a little more advanced. And we'd get into minor scales and minor modes. And we'd move into some of I got a couple get more advanced where I could get into more advanced stuff and teach them blues scales and teach them this and that or whatever. And, and, and I did this for year after year. I did it for, for four and a half years in San Antonio. I did it for... Which JD was about four or five, so she's 18. So another 13 years after, uh, I don't know. I did it for I did it for 20 years, probably teaching people day in and day out, listen them to bang out and slaughter Amazing Grace. God bless his soul. <laughs> and one day, I was listening to jazz music, 
And I was doing something in the kitchen, and it clicked. I know what he's doing. I know what, know what notes he's playing. I know what scale that's from. I can do that. I always had the head knowledge, but suddenly I could live it. Suddenly I could play it. Suddenly it wasn't just something in my head. It was something in my heart, something in my mind. I could hear it in my head and play it without ever having practiced it because I, it suddenly clicked. I could identify. It became a part of me. I'm not preaching to you about music. I don't care if you play the piano or not, but I do want to tell you it's that way with truth. Uh, if you really want to get truth, uh, if you really want to get a revelation of Jesus Christ, uh, if you really want to get, come on, somebody. Uh, if you, Here's what I'm trying to say. If you want a legacy in the Word of God uh, and in the kingdom of God, uh, the only way it's going to happen uh, is to teach new people, uh, to reach for new people. Uh, to reach for them and teach them the basics uh, until it becomes a part of you. Uh, come on, somebody, if I come to church uh, attuned uh, to the need and the wear of God's will for people to repent, uh, I'm not coming to church just for me. Uh, it's not a selfish thing. Uh, if church is a little boring to you, uh, if church is a little old hat, uh, maybe you're coming to church self-centered. Uh, maybe you're coming to church focused on you. Uh, it ain't all about you. Uh, bring somebody with you, uh, and I guarantee you, altar services, will get exciting uh, and the preaching will be more fun. Yeah. Proverbs 11 and 30. The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life and whoever captures souls is wise. Some translations have he that wins souls is wise. Or one translation I just found, the literal standard Bible says he who is wise wins souls. I like that. Can I get a witness? He that wins souls, having a hand in winning somebody is the smartest, wisest, greatest thing that you can do. It'll keep you balanced. Uh, it'll keep you praying. Uh, it'll keep you focused on the right things. Uh, it'll keep you faithful even if the generation around you is not. Uh, come on, somebody. Uh, we can't ever become the Jesus church uh, that has enough. Uh, we can't ever become the Jesus church uh, that's satisfied with 200 and, I don't know, 59 people on Easter. I think it was 259. Uh, amen. Uh, thank God for that. That ties our record from last year. Uh, amen. If we had one one more, we'd have had a new record. Uh, we can't be content with 259. Uh, we can't be content with our four and no more. Uh, we can't just be content. Uh, we must have children. Uh, give me spiritual children uh, or I'm going to die. Uh, i got to see people born of the water. Uh, I've got to see it's been too long uh, since somebody was born of the Spirit. <laughs> Second thing is, similar, you got to strive to make outsiders insiders in order to be faithful for the long term. And we got to get outside of our little clan. Of Ibzan, it was written, Judges 12 and 8, after him, Ibzan of Bethlehem judged Israel. I'm setting you up, hang with me. He had 30 sons and 30 daughters. He gave in marriage outside his clan. Everybody say outside his clan. And 30 daughters he brought in from outside for his sons, and he judged Israel seven years. Then Ibzan died and was buried at Bethlehem. He gave his 30 daughters in marriage outside his clan, and he did the same thing, finding wife for his sons. That's telling it doesn't mean that he went to pagan nations and unbelievers. That's not what he's saying. It means he got out of his clan. He got out of his tribe. He went to another tribe of God's people, and he intermingled. And people that had not had the blessings of growing up with Ibzan as their judge he, and didn't know what it was like to have the kingdom of God quite like it should be, uh, and yet he reached out to them and brought them in, outsiders becoming insiders. Amen. Some, some churches are cliquish. Some churches, God forbid the Jesus church since we're there. I told you it's going to be Caleb, it's, and, and it is, all except this one little point, okay? Then we'll go back to Caleb. We're just going to change the channel right now and go to, I don't know, classic rock. We'll come back to, we'll come back to Caleb in a minute. This is heavy metal with groaning. Just let's get a few seconds. Most churches, when they get to about 200, start developing clans. Not that kind of clan. I see Colin looking at me like, that ain't what I'm talking about. In Louisiana, maybe, but thank God we're not there. He's sitting there going. I mean, this little group doesn't talk to that little group. And that little group fellowships only with that little group and never talks to anybody from that little group. And 
this little group never comes over here, and that little group never goes over there. When's the last time y'all went and talked to them? When's the last time y'all went and talked to them? Clans. Starts in youth groups. But the youth only do it because the parents do it. And now back to Caleb. We're having a giveathon. That's why I stop listening to Caleb. Every time I tune in, they're like raising money. It's like, do they ever have enough money? Some churches are kind of like Caleb. They, it's all just feel good stuff, and they always begging for money. The other trait. Of these unsung heroes, you ready, you ready, you ready? You already know, donkeys. And that sounds really dumb, doesn't it? (laughs) And that sounds funny until you realize that donkeys in the Bible are very symbolic. To be successful in serving the Lord, we're going to have to learn to serve the Lord trusting in the Lord and not to our own devices and strengths. The reason that the Israelites rode donkeys, if you study it out, is because they had no horses. And God actually forbade Israel from gathering to themselves large amount of horses. In fact, Moses said, one day you're going to want a king. And when you want a king like the other nations, that king must be careful not to gather foreign wives to himself and not to have a lot of horses. And Solomon's downfall was because he did both. We don't have time to get into that. And the danger was uh, with horses comes the temptation to put together chariots. Uh, and with horses and chariots, uh, the people were dangering a bit of trusting in their own might, uh, in their own abilities rather than trusting in God. Uh, it became such a metaphor uh, that the psalmist put it like this, Psalms 20 and 7. This is what he said. Uh, he said, some trust in chariots uh, and some in horses, uh, but we trust uh, in the name of the Lord our God. They collapse and fall, but we rise and stand upright. So what is the opposite of a horse? A donkey. And so these men, they rode donkeys. It means they didn't trust in their own strength, their own abilities. They trusted in the name of the Lord and the strength of God. They're faithful. Remember, these are men who are faithful to God for the long term. They utterly changed and transformed their generation because they did not depend upon their own abilities to face life or to fight. And their riding donkeys symbolize trusting in the Lord to fight their battles. It's a hard lesson for some to learn, but it's a key for victorious living. All of us, we had, while we admire the supernatural stories of Gideon and Samson, love to have his hair, I'm just saying... Most of us would rather have the quiet and peaceful lives of the blessings of Tola and Jair and company. And the way you learn to live in a blessed, victorious state is you have to learn letting God fight your battles. Instead of responding to others attacking you verbally, saddling up your war horse, pawing at the ground, Taking the spear and say, giddy up. Can I get a witness? Uh, y'all getting quiet on me now. It's still Caleb. Why not just take it to God in prayer and leave the verdict up to him? I'll, I'll go a step further. And, and we kind of turn back to heavy metal and groaning for a second. I, 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 instead of tell, going around the church and trying to get people to rally to your side uh, by, making, by telling the negativity of that one person that's hurt you to everybody else, and tearing them down to make yourself look better. Why don't you just go in your prayer closet and pour out your complaint to God and let God deal with them? Are you trusting in horses and chariots, or are you riding a donkey? Right? Yeah, yeah, y'all with me here today? Instead of at work, proactively taking up a cause and creating a big ruckus, trying to get people to see that you're right, why not take it to God in prayer and just act in integrity and righteous living and let God vindicate you 
that you're innocent. The reason we don't do it is because that takes patience and that takes trust and that kind of trust requires real genuine faith in God that some of us really don't have. True faith in God is not just saying, well, I know God could do it. True faith in God is I'll wait on him until he does. Not fighting battles you were never meant to fight is the key to having a blessed life here and making it to eternal life. And here, here's the sum of the matter. You say, well, show me scripture. Okay. Proverbs chapter 3, I'm glad you asked. Proverbs chapter 3 verse 5 says this, trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make straight your paths. Be not wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. Do you want to be like Saul who rode a horse? Or do you want to be like Jesus? He's getting ahead of me. Who rode a donkey? When Jesus chose to ride a donkey into Jerusalem rather than a horse, it was a sign of his coming in peace. And he was going to leave the outcome up to God's will. Not what I want, but what your will be done. Which do you ride in situations of your life? It might involve a crucifixion. It might involve some slander. But in the end, God will make sure you're victorious. Come on, let's be like more like Tola and Jair. The only time Samson ever used a donkey was to grab its jawbone and beat people with it. But when you let the donkey live and you ride it, that speaks of humility. To make it live for God, we've got to resist pride and walk humbly. These men didn't lord their judgeship over the people. You know, when Jesus rode a donkey, he didn't just ride a donkey. He, he rode a colt, the foal of a donkey, a young donkey, a little donkey, a donkey that was struggling a little bit to kind of just get one hoof in front of the other. That's, that, that's the lowest humility you can possibly think. He was the king of kings and lord of lords, and he comes in riding the foal of a donkey. Can I tell you that every, it's been said that every spiritual failure is a prayer failure. But I want to remind you that every prayer failure is a pride failure. That when you're not praying like you should, it's because you're riding your war horse. You're getting quiet on the house of the Lord. And if you want to be faithful measured in decades and not minutes, and if you're one of these people that struggles to live for God more than 30 seconds or 30 days in a row, you might ought to get a prayer life, uh, but somewhere you've got to learn to trust the Lord to fight your battles. Uh, stop being a finagling behind the scenes, uh, trying to connive and make it happen. God's for you, who can stand against? I'll choose the donkey. I'll name him Eeyore. Here's the final things. Tola, Jair, Ibzan, Elon, and Abdon. One more time. Tola, Jair, Ibzan, Elon, and Abdon. Probably didn't know these names very well before this lesson and you're probably still struggling to remember them. But hopefully, I can impress their names into your mind. One more time. Unamas. Tola. Jair. Ibsen. Ibzan. Elon. And Abdon. And I want you to remember them for this. This is the final thing. These five men are individually and together a glorious and wonderful type and foreshadowing of Jesus Christ. I'll go as far to say this. Better than any other character in the book of Judges, these men are a type and a foreshadowing of Jesus Christ. See, this is a common thing in the Old Testament. We're heading toward the runway, but let me set it up for you. It's a very common thing. You see somebody in the Old Testament and you look carefully enough, you begin to see those who acted godly. You begin to see an image of, of a, a, a prefiguring of Jesus Christ who was to come. We see Joseph in the book of Genesis sold into slavery of his brothers and put in the pit, but he comes out and he comes out and he's put on top and he reigns and it's, it's a wondrous thing and they're all bowing before him. That, that, is, that, that is a beautiful, wonderful type of Jesus Christ. We see David, a shepherd boy, an unforgotten boy, a nobody, and he's taken from the, the, the sheepfold and, and the sides of the hills of Bethlehem where he is born and, and he's taken all the way to the throne and he rules as a shepherd king and there's nobody like him and God promises him that in Jerusalem there will always be one of your heir to reign. That ultimately is fulfilled in Jesus Christ because both Joseph and Mary were direct descendants of David's. 
It's a very common thing. We preach about this. If you'll stay in the Jesus church more than, say, five minutes, you're going to hear something along those lines. But when we get to the book of Judges, we have the big four. The big four of which we have the majority of print recorded. And they were all supposed to be a wonderful type of Christ, except that type was marred greatly in some way by their stupidity. You with me? Barak, the man in the relationship, could have been a great foreshadowing of Christ, except he wouldn't go stand alone. Had to have Deborah help him. That ruined the type of the Messiah in his life. Well, there it goes. Gideon could have been a perfect type of Christ, except at the end he makes an ephod and led Israel into idolatry. Well, that messes up the type of Christ because his show enough ain't the work of Christ to lead us into idolatry. And then we're going to get next week into Jephthah's life, and he makes this dumb vow, and we'll get into that, but that messed it up. And then you got Samson and his many sins. Samson died at the end so the others could live, but he also died for his own sins with his eyes plucked out. And Samson should have been the greatest type and foreshadowing of Jesus Christ in the entire Bible, but he messed it up. And so if you're going to find Jesus Christ in the book of Judges, you're better served to turn to these unsung heroes, the lesser known five. Consider them with me in this light. Let's begin with Tola. We need to go no further than his name. His name in the Hebrew, in the Hebrew is literally the name of the crimson worm is what it means, a crimson worm. It refers to a specific crawling insect that was common in Palestine in the day. It's used for one of the most fantastic types of Christ in Scripture. One of David's messianic psalms, probably his greatest messianic psalm is Psalms 22. It's the psalm that Jesus quoted while he was on the cross and did not have strength to finish. Psalms 22 and, and verse 1, Jesus quotes, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He was quoting a song trying to get them to see that David foretold this. If he'd had the strength and what they began to play in their minds and their heads was this scripture. Why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning? Verse 2, uh, oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer him by night, but I find no rest. Verse 3, uh, can, yet you are wholly enthroned on the praises of Israel. Verse 4, uh, yet you're, and you our fathers trusted, they trusted, and you delivered them. Verse 5, uh, to you they cried and were rescued, and you they trusted were not put to shame. Verse 6. But me, but I am a worm and not a man. Scorned by mankind and despised by the people. They don't have it. If we were to keep reading, it describes exactly what happened on the cross to the point of what he looked like, to the point of what was said against him. I'll let you read it on your own time. But in the Hebrew, that I am a worm is literally Jesus saying, or David saying, the Messiah would say, I am a Tola. I'm a crimson worm. And the reason it was called the crimson worm is because it was a source of a pigment used to dye clothing red in those days. That this little worm's last act of its life was to affix itself to a tree, give birth to its offspring, and then stretch itself over the young to protect them as cocoon. And then as it was dying, it released a potent red dye which covered the offspring, stained the tree, and gave itself its name. And the type is remarkable. When Jesus Christ is quoting Psalms 22, he's saying, I am Tola. Amen. I am literally, he's quoting, I am the crimson worm, but also I am the judge. Can I get a witness? Because that's what the name means. Uh, he had affixed himself to a tree. Uh, he had done it to cover and protect his children uh, that would come after him. Uh, so they would be covered by his red blood that was shed at his death uh, and can cover them. Uh, it's one of the greatest foreshadowing uh, of Christ. Uh, and it's all called to mind uh, by this name of the guy who's name you can now remember uh, Tola, the crimson worm. Tola, whose name reminds us of this great sacrifice of Calvary. He turned the hearts of the people toward God immediately after the usurper king Abimelech, who had been evil and led them to destruction, had ruled. So did Jesus Christ turn the hearts of the people to God so we ought to be no longer slaves to sin, no longer ruled by Satan. And he did this with his act of the crimson worm on the cross. How ironic that the great Jesus Christ is represented by the lesser-known judges of Israel's history. And how fitting that the only judge that he ever alluded to in his words is Tola, the one you can't remember. After Tola came Jair, whose name means may Jehovah shine forth, or he enlightens. 
the parallel to Jesus Christ is he is Yahweh. He's Jehovah God come in flesh and thus the light of the world. And he comes to enlighten humanity. This doesn't bring darkness. It brings light. It doesn't bring confusion. It brings, it brings help and hope and, and understanding. It's, it's light. Uh, and because Jesus Christ is the light of the world, Jesus Christ literally was the fulfillment of the second obscure but faithful judge of Israel by the name of Jair. The first of the second set of unsung heroes in the book of Judges is Ibzon of Bethlehem. Of Bethlehem. Ibzon means illustrious, renowned. Somebody who became great, who was born in Bethlehem. Do I have to explain it to you or can you just get it? The common Jewish tradition is that this Ibzon is the same as Boaz in the book of Ruth. Can't be proved or disproved. It can't be disproved either. But if that be true, Boaz as a kinsman redeemer becomes one of the great types of Jesus Christ in the Old Testament. And it's all called to mind by Ibzon. Next was Elon, which means oak. It's a stretch. It's a stretch. I get it. It's a stretch. I can't find a scripture that says Jesus is an oak. But given that more obvious types of Christ surround him in these scriptures, we can think of Elon as the same. It's not hard to find some similarities from a little acorn insignificant that grows into a mighty oak. This, 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 this God who comes to earth in the form of a little baby and spends 30 years maturing before embarking on what God wanted him to do. And every storm that hit its life, he held true. And the last of the faithful but obscure judges is Abdon, whose name means service or servanthood. What a beautiful portrait of the Messiah. Though he ruled the universe and was Lord of all, he's willing to take up a, a servant's towel and serve imperfect humanity as an example to us. The Jewish historian Josephus writes of Abdon. He says, quote, He alone, Abdon alone, is recorded to have been happy in his children for the public affairs were so peaceable and secure that he had no occasion to perform glorious actions. That his focus was being happy in his kids. And he didn't have to fight because everything was as it should be. <laughs> what a glorious type of Christ. He's not fighting today. He already won the battle. It's finished. It's done. He delights. He, God's not worried about the devil. God's not freaking out over the Antichrist. He delights in his children. He wants to see his children serving him. He wants to see his children blessed. He wants every man to have a donkey and a chicken in the pot. Not a donkey in the pot. Ride a donkey and a chicken in the pot. Stand with me. Together, these five men's reign and prefigurement of Christ speak to us of the coming millennial reign when Jesus Christ will rule and reign for a thousand years on the earth. How many believe it's going to happen? One of my favorite scriptures that we don't ever deal with anywhere else, so I want to deal with it here. One of my favorite scriptures of this little and lesser known scriptures of this time is found in Zechariah who tells us of Jerusalem in the millennial reign. This is what he says. I'm in uh, Zechariah, uh, um, hold on, there's a piece of spit, hold on a sec, 8 and 5. Oh, you're already there. And, and, and this is a favorite deal, that, that one day when Jesus Christ rules on this earth for 1,000 years, how many believe it's really going to happen? It's talking about Jerusalem. It says, and the streets of the city shall be full of boys and girls, watch this, playing in its streets. It, it, and this is such a glorious verse because right now, that's kind of hard to imagine, frankly. Right now, the boys and girls are not being sent out by their moms and dad and go play in the street. We don't care. It's very tumultuous in Israel right now. We need to pray for that. But, but when Jesus Christ rules and reigns over Israel, in Jerusalem, children are going to play in perfect peace and happiness in the streets of Jerusalem. And then the righteous will be as strong trees planted by rivers of living water. And this speaks us of the coming new heaven and new earth and new Jerusalem. There Jehovah God will shine forth. The one born of Bethlehem will be illustrious because there is no son. Jesus Christ is going to be the light. And there the servants of the Lord will rule and reign because of the work of he who was the crimson worm of Calvary. But you listen to a passage of scripture in Isaiah about these coming better days. It's the last verse. Isaiah 1 verses, two verses. Isaiah 1, 26 and 27. He says, and I will restore, watch this. I will restore your... I'll restore your what? Judges. I'll restore your judges as at the first and your counselors as at the beginning. And afterward you shall be called the city of righteousness, the faithful city. Verse 27. Zion shall be redeemed by justice. When? When I restore your judges. 
and those in her who repent by righteousness. When's that going to happen? When I restore your judges. Time out. Is he going to restore Abimelech? Gideon? Samson? I don't know. But I, I have a good feeling I know some of the names. Now I do because I came to church on a Wednesday night at the Jesus Church on Wednesday, April the 3rd. I think that it's, it's even kind of heady stuff. But could it be, could it be that when Jesus Christ sets up his reign to rule forever, that in supreme positions reigning with Christ will be five men, Tola, Jair, Ibzon, Elon, and Abner unsung heroes of faithfulness. How do I join them? By stopping and worry about who gets credit. By trusting in the Lord <laughs> and not in my own might. Letting him fight my battles for me. By being faithful day in and day out. By my faithfulness not being measured in weeks, but in decades and in lifetimes. By enduring to the end, by impacting my generation to serve Jesus Christ, by quietly going about my business, living for him, unsung heroes, one day will be exalted. God bless you tonight. Raise your hand and receive the word of the Lord tonight. before you. Let us, oh God, be faithful, oh God. We want to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. We want that to be, God, the pronouncement over our life, oh God. Let us judge this life, God, rightly. Let us be a judge of righteousness and goodness. And Father, we glorify you and we praise you. We bring our lives to you once again, God. We need your help, your strength, your power. We need your touch in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, God, for your blessing. Thank you, God, for your goodness. Thank you, God, for your mercy. Thank you, God, for your love. Thank you for your grace. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, God, for being the crimson worm that hung on Calvary for me. Thank you, God, for forgiving me. Thank you for covering my sins with your blood when I was baptized in your precious name. Thank you, God, oh, Lord, God, for the gift of the Holy Spirit. Thank you, God, for this church, oh, God, and people that are quietly faithful. Thank you, God, for people who pray, even though they have accolades or, or people don't call their name. Uh, thank God, oh, Lord, for people, God, that make eternity priority. We glorify you. We praise you. We love you. In Jesus' name. Somebody clap your hands to the Lord. Come on, he's worthy. Come on, he's worthy. Hallelujah. We praise you. 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 Hallelujah. God bless you. Remember all of these things. Amen. If you'd like to be a part of, of, this, of J.D.'s Senior Moment Friday, I think you're welcome to come. If you're, if, as long as you come and sit in the back and participate. You have to participate, I think. Amen on that. Remember Church Sunday. Amen. Pastors will be preaching both services. Come and act like you've never heard me preach before at all. Come, come act like my jokes are funny. <laughs> Invite somebody and somebody will be laughing. God bless you.